Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our lecture today. Tonight, we're talking about stroke advancements when 911 is called with Dr. Duffus from Bay State Neurology. Dr. Duffus is an expert in neurocritical care, neuroimaging, and vascular neurology. Tonight, all attendees will be muted, but you can type your questions in the Q&A box, which should be to the right of your screen. And we'll address those questions after Dr. Duffus's presentation. So thank you, Dr. Duffus, for taking time out of your schedule to present on this important topic. And to um, raise awareness for uh, uh, the stroke month in May. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about advances in emergency stroke care. Um, which is, okay, so uh, the objectives of the lecture tonight are to familiarize the audience with warning signs and symptoms of stroke and to discuss the evaluation and treatment of stroke. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about stroke facts. Um, there's about 800,000 strokes per year, and stroke is actually now the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. On average, one person every 40 seconds suffers a stroke, and one out of four strokes are recurrent. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody to, uh, as I always say to my patients, become best friends with your primary care physician to make sure that, you know, all the risk factors um, that we're going to talk about in a few seconds um, are being controlled so that that, that risk goes down and, and to prevent uh, recurrent strokes. Um, so I'm going to just talk generally about the, the two uh, broad categories of stroke. Um, there's ischemic stroke, which is basically a blockage of a blood vessel in the brain, um, which leads to lack of blood flow to the affected area. And the symptoms that result from that um, are due to the uh, lack of blood in the specific area of the brain. Uh, a hemorrhagic stroke is a second a broad category of strokes, um, which uh, results from a rupture of a blood vessel, uh, resulting in leakage of blood into the affected area. Uh, the vast majority of strokes are ischemic, uh, meaning there's a blockage of an artery um, leading to symptoms. Um, and as you see, 87% 80, of all strokes uh, are of the ischemic type. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of times patients ask me, what is a mini stroke? I was told by somebody that I had a mini stroke. Uh, what is that doc? Um, so basically a mini stroke is really on a continuum with uh, an ischemic stroke. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a blockage of an artery um, so uh, it, it, it's almost a threatened stroke. Um, the only difference between a TIA and a, and a stroke is that the blockage resolves uh, without any permanent damage to the brain. But again, you can think of it as a continuum with an ischemic stroke. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, a TIA should be handled just like a stroke. It's an emergency just like a stroke. Um, I want to emphasize that a stroke is a brain attack. So everybody's familiar with the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, and most people are aware to call 911 when they're experiencing these symptoms. Um, and so I, I want to emphasize that a stroke is a brain attack. Um, again, it results from blockage of an artery in the brain, similar to a blockage of, a, of an artery in the heart. Um, and so it is an emergency, and um, you should call 911 if you're experiencing any symptoms. Um, so some of the factors uh, that affect stroke risk, um, some of them can be controlled and some can't. Um, factors that can be controlled, the most important one is smoking. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that nowadays in our society people still smoke, but uh, unfortunately, that's the case. Smoking really increases uh, your risk of having a stroke uh, significantly, as does high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, and diabetes. Um, factors that are not in one's control are things like age, ethnicity, and sex. Um, black patients, Hispanic patients are at much higher risk of having a stroke uh, than Caucasians, um, and so it's important uh, to be aware of that fact if you are experiencing any symptoms that might be suggestive uh, of a stroke. 
Um, so the uh, the this this map is just to illustrate the point that um, um, there is what we call a stroke belt around the south of the country, where just the incidence of these risk factors we talked about earlier um, is high, and so the prevalence and incidence of stroke. Um, is concentrated in that uh, purple area of the map. Um, as you can see in the Northeast where we live, um, it's not so bad. However, I want to emphasize again that a stroke can happen to anybody at any time. Um, and so not to, uh, uh, not to dwell on that map. Um, yeah. So um, the signs and symptoms of stroke, um, the word stroke is actually uh, derived from ancient Greece, um, at the time it was thought that uh, the gods had struck someone down. Um, and so that's where we got the saying that um, somebody's having a stroke. Uh, the key sign is that a change occurs suddenly and quickly. And so we'll see when we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the signs and symptoms of the key is that um, it, it happens rather quickly. Um, so anything from sudden change in speech, either garbled, slurred, or nonsense, uh, or sudden loss of vision in one, one or both eyes, uh, sudden weakness of the face, arm, and leg on one side, sudden dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, uh, or severe headache, uh, particularly if it's a headache unlike uh, one has experienced in the past, uh, that last symptom is usually a symptom of a hemorrhagic type of stroke, which talk, we talked about earlier as a bleeding kind of stroke. Um, so if, excuse me, if we experience any of those symptoms, uh, the, 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 the key things to remember are act fast. So um, if the face, um, asking the person to smile um, if, if there's any asymmetry in the face, either drooping on one side or asymmetry, um, arm, asking the person to raise both arms um, and looking for weakness on one side, uh, speech, asking the person to speak and noticing any slurring or babbling, uh, strained speech, uh, then, then the T comes in, which means time to call 911. Um, so I, I can't emphasize this point enough. Um, it, it really, is, again, it's a stroke is a brain attack, and so it really means it's a medical emergency. So don't wait to speak to your primary care doctor. Don't drive yourself or ask someone to drive yourself to the hospital. Um, and don't, don't wait to call 911, even the, if the symptoms have gone away. Again, um, that could herald a TIA, and that means it's still a medical emergency, even if the, the symptoms have gone away. Um, so when you call 911, um, the things that will happen are that the ambulance will arrive and assess, start the assessment process. Um, in some cases, they can provide additional needed treatments, such as oxygen, starting an IV, uh, things that are needed before getting to the hospital. Um, effective treatment of stroke, uh, I want to emphasize, uh, is, is dependent on time. So the, the sooner that the treatment starts, the better off the patient will be. Um, and it's been shown that uh, EMS notifying the hospital before the ambulance arrives um, has been shown to lead to shorter symptom to treatment times. And we'll get in, into it in a minute how important that is. Um, so once you call 911, um, the, uh, the, the operator will prioritize the call because again, we, we all know that it is a medical emergency. Um, and so we, we know that patients who use 911 and EMS services, um, that is associated with early arrival to the ER, um, and your odds are, you're twice as likely to reach the ER within three hours of onset of symptoms. Um, and that obviously leads to a quicker evaluation and treatment uh, in the emergency department. Um, looking down the line at the future, um, this is something that we're all really excited about. Um, the mobile stroke units are gonna be able to, um, at some point in the near future, uh, assess the patients in the field um, with a CAT scanner in the back of the ambulance. Um, the importance of the CAT scanner, as we'll see in a minute, is that it can dif differentiate between uh, a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleeding kind of stroke, uh, and an ischemic stroke, which um, has potential um, 
uh, efficacious treatments that we're gonna get into it, uh, in a minute. And so being able to tell the difference between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke uh, is very important. Uh, and the only way to do that really is with the CAT scanner um, and mobile stroke units. Um, again, in the near future, uh, we'll be able to have that capability of having a CAT scanner in the back of the mobile stroke unit um, and being able to differentiate between the two. Um, let me go back one, one slide. So once we get to the emergency room, um, the goal is for a rapid evaluation. So the emergency physician in consultation with a neurologist is going to evaluate the patient, um, do a quick exam, make sure that you know all the ancillary things that should have been done in the ambulance and pre-hospital arrival were done um, with the goal of getting the patient to uh, the CT scanner within 20 minutes. Um, and once that's done, the ER physician in collaboration with the neurologist is going to determine uh, if the patient is eligible for the uh, clot busting medication from Blytics, which we're going to talk about uh, in more detail in, in a minute here. Um, excuse me. Um, and smaller hospitals, um, and even within the Bay State system, uh, we have, um, you know, hub hospitals at Noble, Wing, uh, and all the other satellite hospitals at Bay State. Um, we are able to provide telemedicine, which is basically what we're doing now. It's sort of like a big Zoom meeting uh, where the emergency room physician um, gets on the, um, the camera, like I'm doing now, and, and is able to communicate with the neurologist. Um, as you see from the picture here, you know, you've got the emergency room physician talking to the patient. Um, you've got the camera and the computer screen where the neurologist, um, you know, myself or someone else uh, is at home or somewhere else remotely and is able to examine and talk to the patient um, and collaborate with the emergency uh, physician in deciding whether the patient is a candidate for either thrombolytics or more advanced treatments that we're going to get into uh, in a minute. Um, so the advantages of telemedicine are that they result in a more accurate decision making um, regarding, like I said, the eligibility of the, um, of the patient for clot busting medications uh, compared to just the phone call with the neurologist. Um, and studies have shown that the safety and efficacy is similar to patients um, seen at stroke centers, meaning that it's the same as if a neurologist was there at the bedside uh, examining the patient. And again, it allows 24 access to stroke specialists at smaller hospitals, um, off hours. Um, so now we can basically um, uh, take care of patients around the clock, even, even at satellite hospitals and at smaller hospitals. Um, it allows the neurologist to make a decision, um, like I said, not just in terms of treatment with thrombolytics, uh, but also triaging patients to transfer uh, to more specialized centers. So if you're out in a rural part of the country, um, you know, the, the neurologist can make a decision as to whether or not that hospital is appropriate for you to stay at uh, or if you need to be transferred to a, a tertiary center like Bay State. Um, so now I'm going to get a little bit into treatment. Um, the, um, the, the treatment of stroke, again, uh, it being a, a, a brain attack with a blockage of an artery, again, focusing on ischemic stroke treatment. Um, the, the only FDA-approved treatment at the moment is a tissue plasminogen activator, uh, which is a clot-dissolving medication, which is given to patients uh, with ischemic stroke. Uh, but it has to be administered within uh, four and a half hours of the onset of symptoms. Um, and there's a long list of eligibility criteria um, it, you know, things that vary from, you know, if the patient has had a recent surgery, if they're prone to bleeding, um, you know, either from an ulcer or any other source of bleeding. Um, so there's, there's multiple criteria that the neurologist and the emergency room physician are going to go through um, with the patient in, in order to, the, um, uh, to arrive at a conclusion whether or not uh, they are a candidate for this medicine. Um, and I want to emphasize that even though the medicine can be uh, administered within four and a half hours of symptom onset, uh, the sooner the better. Uh, Two million brain cells die every second during a stroke. So the brain, as I tell my patients, is unlike any other organ in the body. Um, if you cut yourself on your skin, 
Um, you know, all of us know that within a few days, you know, the, the, the cut is going to heal and the, the uh, skin cells are going to regenerate to the point where if the cut isn't deep enough, uh, you're not even going to notice a scar. Uh, the brain is unlike that in that, you know, it doesn't regenerate itself. It doesn't, it doesn't really heal itself. And so it's very sensitive uh, to damage. And so even though the medicine can be administered up to four and a half hours, um, that doesn't mean you should wait up to four and a half hours. Um, it, it's, it's better to call 911 right away because, again, two million brain cells die every second during a stroke. Um, and when the medicine is given, the, the TPA is given to a patient, one out of three patients will achieve a good outcome, uh, meaning no significant disability when it's given uh, within the first three hours. Once you get from three hours, uh, in between three hours and four and a half hours, the percentage of patients who will achieve a good outcome starts to drop exponentially um, every, every 10 to 15 minutes that, 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 um, that hour goes by. Um, Something that we're excited about at Bay State um, and in the stroke community is a new medicine called Tenecteplase, uh, or TNK, which is very similar to uh, TPA. Um, it's actually a recombinant form of TPA, uh, which has a longer duration of action and also more specific uh, to fresh clot in the body. Um, and so it has an advantage over TPA in that it can be administered as a single injection as opposed to a drip. Um, which uh, TPA requires. And so it actually saves some time uh, in administering the medicine to patients. Um, and as I said, it's not licensed in the U.S. yet for primary treatment of stroke. However, studies do show that it has similar efficacy and safety compared to TPA. So we're all very excited. And in fact, at Bay State, um, we've almost transitioned entirely uh, to TNK, uh, again, because the advantages of, of uh, time saving compared to TPA and that uh, it's administered as a single injection. And so that, that does save time for the patient. And again, time is brain cells. Um, so other treatments when patients are not eligible for TPA, um, aspirin has been shown in multiple studies to decrease the likelihood of a death and recurrent stroke after an ischemic stroke. Um, you know, the, the, the risk of a recurrent stroke within the first two weeks uh, is relatively high for a stroke patient. And so aspirin is usually administered um, after TPA is given, after 24 hours of TPA or immediately after uh, in patients who are not eligible for TPA. Um, and so depending on the type and the severity of the stroke, um, what I do, which is uh, what, what's exciting to me, is the catheter-based procedures, uh, which attempt to mechanically extract the clot, and we're going to get into a little bit of that uh, in a minute. Um, surgery may be needed for hemorrhagic strokes uh, or to deal with the complications of an ischemic stroke, excuse me. Um, including swelling of the brain, which can happen very often uh, when there is a large uh, part of the brain uh, involved in the stroke. Um, so this is what I do basically, um, you know, 24 seven, uh, which is uh, thrombectomy, um, which is basically a mechanical removal of the clot via catheter system. What we do is we insert a catheter um, via either an artery in the leg near the groin area or through the wrist. Um, this is not for every stroke patient. Obviously, just like TPA is not for every stroke patient, there's a list of criteria that we go down um, in deciding if somebody is a candidate. But basically, uh, the, the main criteria is that there has to be a blockage of one of the large arteries in the brain. So a large clot. Um, and the patient has to present within six hours. Um, with, with specialized uh, uh, scans and criteria that we're going to get into in a minute, um, that can be extended up to 24 hours. But again, that's not for most stroke patients. Uh, most stroke patients that have a large artery really do have to present uh, within six hours. And again, the sooner the better. Um, you know, as I said before, time is brain. Um, so this illustration is, to, is just to show the, the point, again, that like brain cells die uh, literally by the millions every, every minute that a stroke goes by. Um, and so the picture on the left is really a, 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 an illustration of what we call a small core infarct, meaning there's a small area in the brain that's irreversibly damaged, 
versus the blue area where it's um, not getting enough oxygen from the blood because of the blockage in the artery, uh, but that area is not, uh, is not uh, irreversibly damaged yet. And as we see from left to right, um, as time goes on, that area, which is irreversibly damaged, uh, grows and grows exponentially until you get in most stroke patients by 12 hours, you really see just a match of the area that's irreversibly damaged, um, you know, just growing to the size um, that, that uh, you know, encompasses that whole area. Um, and so the blue area, the, the area that's, that's not irreversibly damaged, what we call the penumbra, is the area that we as stroke neurologists are trying to preserve. That's the area that we're trying to save uh, in doing these procedures and administering these medicines. Um, so <clears throat> I talked earlier about, um, uh, about the criteria that we would use uh, to determine whether a patient is a candidate uh, for these procedures after six hours. Um, and this is basically uh, what we would use. I mean, there's, there's additional criteria, but just as a general rule of thumb, what we look for is we look for, number one, we look for a blocked artery, which the scan on the top here uh, is showing us an occlusion of the left middle cerebral artery, which is the main artery essentially that brings blood uh, to, to the front of the brain. Um, and so that arrow is showing us uh, the arrow here on the uh, on the right of the screen uh, is showing us the uh, the blockage there, um, and so that that would be criteria number one. And then the next thing we look at uh, on a specialized CAT scan, what we call a CT perfusion, um, is uh, what we talked about earlier, which is we're looking for areas of the brain that are not irreversibly damaged. Um, that we could potentially save with one of these procedures or uh, medicines. Um, and so we see here in the purple um, a very small area, which represents the core infarct, uh, which is the area that's irreversibly damaged, uh, and a very large green area on the scan here, uh, which is the penumbra, which we talked about earlier, which represents the area of the brain that's not irreversibly damaged. Um, and so that's, the, that's our target. Um, uh, for therapy. We're trying to save that area in green here. Um, and so this, this is where I work um, in the cath lab at Bay State. Um, this isn't actually the cath lab at Bay State, but it's a, it's a representation of a cath lab. Um, and what we see here, it's, you know, it's, it's basically a minimally invasive uh, procedure that we do under x-ray. Um, the, the tube behind the gentleman here uh, is the x-ray tube. Uh, this would be the, the table where the patient uh, would lie on. Um, and what we do is we puncture the artery uh, in the leg, as I said earlier, uh, and through there we can feed the catheters and the devices that, that we use to do these procedures. Um, this person over here is the um, x-ray tech, um, which again, we're administering some low dose radiation to be able to see and guide us uh, during the procedure. Um, and so that's that's what, uh, what what's going on here in this picture. We're able to see on the screen um, the navigation from um, you know the the artery in the groin all the way up to the arteries in the brain uh, under X-ray, and it'll show up on the screen here. Um, so currently, the two the two uh, major paradigms uh, in in thrombectomy uh, catheter based procedures, otherwise. Um, is, is stent retrievers is, is number one. Um, so what these are, are a, a fully retrievable stent, as you see here, it's very similar to what our cardiology colleagues have been doing in the heart for many years, um, with the exception that we don't leave the stent in the arteries in the brain. Um, as, as shown in the representation here, what happens is we deploy the stent within the artery, trying to get um, the stent to open within uh, the substance, the body of the clot, um, to try to get it to integrate into the struts of the stent. Um, and then what we do is we inflate a balloon uh, that sits uh, in a catheter uh, in the artery in the neck. And what that does is it, it arrests blood flow uh, to the brain so that when we're pulling the clot out of the brain, um, you know, you don't have the potential 
of, of blood washing pieces of the uh, of the clot up into other uh, more more distant arteries in the brain. Um, so we pull the stent with the clot embedded in it uh, while the balloon is inflated to kind of get it get it out of the body. Um, that's the idea with the stent retrievers. The other general paradigm is what we call aspiration catheters, which are these very large bore uh, catheters, which we um, uh, which we attach to a suction. Um, the middle picture here is a representation of a pump um, produced by, by Medtronic, but which basically just um, applies suction to the catheter. Uh, so we bring the catheter up to the um, to the clot. Uh, in the brain, and then we attach it to the pump, um, and then we're able to suction out uh, um, a clot. And this is actually uh, a picture from one of the um, uh, one of my patients, where we were able to extract this almost uh, two and a half centimeter clot uh, very recently, actually using one of these aspiration uh, systems. Um, so, in general, uh, thrombectomy we know is very beneficial for patients who have large artery occlusions. In fact, uh, when, they're when they present to the hospital within six hours uh, and we're able to treat them, they're, they're almost two and a half times more likely to attain functional independence uh, compared to patients who, who don't receive this treatment. Um, and so, um, you know, we're, we're all very excited. And again, this is why I get up uh, from bed every morning. Uh, is 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 to uh, you know to see that impact uh, that it has on patients with large artery occlusions um, compared to patients who receive excuse me who receive um, uh, just the IV medication the, the thrombolytics um, it the, the procedure is very safe in terms of uh, mortality and risk from bleeding is is very comparable to uh, patients who only receive the clot busting medication uh, or best medical management. Um, the studies have shown that uh, it is beneficial across all, um, all types of patients, including patients who are uh, very elderly, uh, patients who don't qualify for TPA for um, any reason, uh, either you know, because they're on a blood thin medication or any of the other long list of criteria that has to be met uh, for, um, uh, to be eligible for, for the IV medications. Um, and so whether you receive it or you don't, um, the the benefits the benefits of thrombectomy uh, are there across all groups. Um, so I just I, I want to kind of conclude the talk um, just giving a real life example of a patient that we treated recently at Bay State um, just to kind of drive home the point. Um, this was a 22 year old woman who was at work when she experienced dizziness and double vision, and uh, fortunately she didn't ignore it even though she was a young lady. Um, she actually called her mother. Um, and, and again, I want to emphasize, this is probably not what you should do if you're experiencing symptoms of a stroke, but her mother actually drove her to the ER. But again, I want to emphasize, you really want to call 911. Uh, she was very fortunate that our ER staff, including the triage nurses, uh, are very skilled and adept at recognizing symptoms of a stroke. So she was brought right into the emergency room uh, when she presented, um, and she was evaluated within two hours of symptom onset. Um, and so the, the evaluation by the stroke neurologist, Dr. Padmanabhan, and the ER physician uh, led to the identification of a stroke, and she actually did receive the clot busting medication TNK. Um, I was given a call by the ER physician to look at her scans, um, and this is what I saw on her scan. Oh, let me go back. Um, the green arrow is pointing to the um, lack of blood flow in the major artery to the back of her brain, what we call the basilar artery. Um, you can see there that really um, there should be brightness there where the arrow is, just like there is below the arrow. Um, and that, that means that there's a clot there that's blocking blood flow to, to the back of the brain, uh, including the brain stem. Um, and so when we brought her to the angiogram, uh, uh, to, to the, excuse me, to the cath lab and did an angiogram, uh, this is what we saw. We saw an occlusion of the basilar artery. Again, this is supposed to be a, a big artery uh, going towards the back of the brain, and you see it over here that it's cut off. Um, and this was the result after we did one pull uh, with the stent retriever, as we see uh, contrast filling the artery and then filling these other branches here that go to the back of her brain. Um, she is fortunately doing very well right now. 
Uh, again, she was lucky that the, the triage nurses and the uh, ED staff is well trained at Bay State uh, and we were able to help her. Um, so that's just to emphasize again, uh, if you think that you might be having a stroke, uh, don't ignore it. Uh, it is a medical emergency. Uh, again, a stroke is a brain attack. Uh, think of it like a heart attack, only in the brain. And, and, and again, we all know that when you're having a heart attack, uh, you should call 911. And that's if you take nothing else from this lecture, uh, that's what I want you to, you know, to go home with, which is that a stroke is a brain attack. Uh, and treat it as a medical emergency uh, because we do have effective treatments for stroke, uh, but they are dependent on presenting to the emergency room uh, in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duffus. That was really great. Um, and uh, a lot of new technology and amazing that you can save this 22-year-old woman from any kind of debilitating illness with your thrombectomy. Amazing. Thank you, sir. Um, really, yeah, I mean, just impressive. Uh, there is one question and um, right now, so we invite the audience to type in your questions into the Q&A box and um, Dr. Duffus will uh, be happy to uh, answer them for you. The first one is, uh, can you differentiate the difference between the two types of stroke again that you had mentioned early on in the presentation? Sure, absolutely. And Sue, can you see me okay on the camera? Because my, my screen is dark, so I just want to make sure people can see me. Yeah, um, if you could end your presentation, then yeah. you would be on the screen. You can end that. I think you'll be more visible. Yeah, Is that better? Perfect. Well, there we go. That's great. Okay, that's wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. Th thank you. So, um, so to answer the question, yes. Um, going back to uh, one of the earlier slides, so the, the main, the two main uh, categories of stroke uh, are an ischemic stroke, where again there's a blockage of one of the arteries in the brain, either a large artery. Uh, or a small artery in the brain, it doesn't really take much. Um, again, the brain is a very sensitive organ, and so um, it doesn't take much uh, in terms of disruption to the blood flow to cause a stroke. Um, so that's what we call an ischemic stroke, where there's a blockage of one of the arteries in the brain, versus a hemorrhagic stroke, meaning the bleeding kind of stroke, um, is when there's a rupture, a leakage of blood from one of the arteries in the brain. So either from an aneurysm that has ruptured uh, or just from a, a small artery in the brain which has ruptured uh, and even sometimes a vein uh, causing leakage of blood into the brain. And that's what we call again, a, a hemorrhagic stroke. So, so those are the two broad categories. In your thrombectomy, you are, you are curing or basically working on the ischemic strokes. Correct. That, that's, that's absolutely correct. I do, I do do procedures to treat um, a hemorrhagic strokes from leakage of blood from, a, uh, from an aneurysm. Again, that represents a, a minority of, of stroke patients. Um, like we saw uh, from that slide in the presentation, 87% of strokes uh, are actually of the ischemic variety, meaning that there's a blockage of an artery in the brain. And, and as you said, Sue, that's where we do the thrombectomy procedures. Um, you know, for the minority of stroke patients that present with hemorrhagic strokes, um, you know, the, the, the small percentage of them uh, that present from a hemorrhagic stroke from an aneurysm, there are treatments that we can offer them. I didn't get, I didn't get into that in this talk because, I, I, again, I kind of wanted to focus on the majority of strokes, which are ischemic. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and Marianne, who asked that question, said thank you for the information. Thank you. Thank um, you for, for joining us, Marianne. Uh, the next question is, what risk factors did the 22-year-old have? Uh, that is David a good question. Example. I mean, obviously, stroke is not, as we saw from the, um, from the risk factor slide, and, the, you know, the, 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 the main risk factor really uh, 
uh, is age. So it's really uncommon for a 22 year old to present with a stroke. Um, it turns out that she had a, a very a specific medical condition called a patent foramen ovale, which we call a PFO for short. Uh, which is really a communication between the right side of the heart uh, and the left side of the heart, which makes people prone uh, to passing blood clots from, a, from, from one side of the heart to the other. Uh, and so we believe that that was the cause of her stroke. Um, and that was uh, ascertained after you know, investigations while she was in the hospital. Uh, so that, that is a good question because, again, you know, strokes are not common in, in, in young people. Um, they're, they're more common as we get older. Uh, but I, I presented that case just to underscore the fact that, you know, a stroke can happen to anybody at any time. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, the next question. Oh, there is another thank you for the information, especially for the content on the TNK. Yep. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm actually, and, I'm, I'm able to see them, them on the, the right side of my screen here. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, do you want me to continue reading them? And um, you... uh, sure, I'll, I'll um, actually, I, I can see them, so I'll just go to the next okay. one, which um, okay. is from Celeste, and she's asking, um, how long does a TIA last? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, classically defined, a TIA lasts less than 24 hours, but what we found through studies uh, is that most TIAs actually last a lot less than that. Uh, the symptoms can last anywhere from a few seconds to minutes to hours. Um, it's actually pretty uncommon to have symptoms up to a day, although uh, classically defined, that's the cutoff that we use is 24 hours uh, for symptom duration. Again, most people only experience it for a few minutes to hours. Um, the next question is about uh, signs and symptoms that differentiate the two types of strokes. Uh, that is a very good question, unfortunately. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and this is why we're so excited about mobile stroke units, um, the only way to really be able to tell the difference between a hemorrhagic stroke and an ischemic stroke is with a CAT scanner. Uh, we're able to very, very accurately pick up blood leaking into the brain on a CAT scan. Um, and as I said, that's why we're so excited about mobile stroke units, because we'll be able to diagnose people in the field, um, you know, with that CAT scanner in the back of the ambulance. Um, so unlike heart attacks, you know, stroke, like I said, is very similar to heart attacks, but unlike heart attacks, um, you know, there, there's not a field test as of yet uh, to differentiate between a hemorrhagic stroke uh, and an ischemic stroke, again, aside from, from a CAT scan. So that, that's a very good question. Um, then scrolling to the next one, it says, what role does high blood pressure play in stroke? Um, so that, that's a very excellent question, Barbara, and it, it actually plays a role in both of the major kinds of stroke, uh, both hemorrhagic and ischemic. Um, I have high blood pressure myself, so I always kind of relate to my patients and I sort of tell them that personal story that I'm dealing with it myself. Um, and and it, it certainly is a risk factor for, for both kinds. Uh, blood pressure wears and tears the small arteries in the brain. Um, and so that, that actually increases your risk of both an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke, like I said. So anybody who's dealing with high blood pressure, it's very important, like I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, to become best friends with your primary care physician uh, to make sure that that's under control. Uh, we call blood pressure the silent killer because it doesn't cause any symptoms. And so, um, you know, I always tell my patients, make sure you're actually taking your blood pressure at home. Uh, you know, invest the $20 in a, in a, in a cuff uh, to make sure that, you know, your medicine is actually earning its money. I think that's the last question. Um, that I see on the I screen, one, unless you see anything else. I, I, yes, I have one more. It's yep. um, when you're uh, performing your thrombectomies, is there a particular area of the brain that the strokes are happening, whether it's left brain, right brain, or the back of the brain, like this 22-year-old woman? 
Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the uh, blockage can occur in any of the arteries in the brain. Um, like I said, the procedures that we do, the thrombectomies, are only for uh, occlusions of the large arteries in the brain. But, you know, that, that there can be a blockage in the small arteries. Uh, it can be right, left, back, front. Um, there's, you know, it doesn't discriminate, in other words. Very good. Um, I believe that's it. If you don't see any, yep, more, I don't see any I just, more questions unless anybody else wants to type type a question in the uh, the yeah, fifteen we'll just minutes. Give we have a minute. Left. I'm like real. I just think it's really exciting about, like you said, the mobile units, the TNK, the telemedicine. Um, are you um, doing a lot of telemedicine to um, other community hospitals in the area? Yeah, we, we have do a, a number. Of, like I said, I think you know the the advantage of telemedicine is that it allows uh, you know neurology neurology physicians like myself to. Um, you know, to reach out to the smaller hospitals that may not have, you know, an in-house neurologist 24-7. Um, and so, you know, we, we've been doing it at Bay State for some time now. I've been at Bay State almost eight years. Uh, and almost since I started there, you know, we, we've, been, we've been doing this. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of people might notice that since COVID, you know, a lot of doctor's visits have been converted to, you know, to kind of this telemedicine platform where you're at home, um, you know, the doc might be at his home or at the hospital, um, you know, and is able to interact with the patients, uh, you know, via, via telemedicine. I'm, I'm proud to say that, again, we, we were sort of at the, the vanguard of that at Bay State in the, in the neurology department for, for many, many years. Excellent. Well, so I think thank we have you, one, Doctor. Oh, we have sorry, one more please, question I think that just came in. Um, Terrific. Uh, so Kimberly is asking: Is memory loss uh, connected to a stroke? Um, certainly, it can be. Again, you know, the, the brain is a very fascinating organ, and uh, you know, again, it's very unique in that, like, when there's damage to it. Um, you know, you don't, it doesn't regenerate, it doesn't, you know, you, you can't regrow brain. Um, and so there are definitely areas of the brain within the temporal lobes of the brain, um, which, which are involved in memory, uh, that if they are damaged, certainly memory uh, loss can be a result of that. Um, you know, it, it, it's not the most common presentation of a stroke, I would have to say. Again, it, it's typically those things that we talked about in the, uh, at the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, you know, things like facial drooping, uh, weakness on one side of the body, uh, loss of vision, either garbled or slurred speech, those tend to be the more common presentations of a stroke. Uh, but certainly memory loss uh, has been known to occur uh, with strokes. Um, and there's one more question that just came in from Mary that she's asking, can you have a stroke and not know it? That is a very excellent question, Mary. Um, yes, to answer your question, absolutely. In fact, people who have strokes on the right side of the brain uh, oftentimes have what we call neglect, uh, which means they're not aware of their deficits. And not only that, but they're not aware of the entire uh, left side of their body. So the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and the left side of the brain controls the right. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the patients with right-sided strokes may not be aware that they even have the left side of the body, let alone that there's something wrong with it. Um, so, you know, it, again, it, it just emphasizes the point that, you know, if you see somebody who may be having symptoms of a stroke, um, you know, call 911 if you think that you might be having symptoms of a stroke, uh, call 911 as well. And I think that's the last one, Sue. Well, thank you, Dr. Duffus, for taking time to present on this topic. It was really enlightening, and I hope our audience enjoyed it as well. Thank and you we'll so much for recording this me. session. Oh, thank, thank you. you, and we hope to have you back again sometime. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great evening. Thank you to the audience for listening. <laughs>